If you have your Bibles with you tonight, I'd invite your attention to uh, Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Andy and I are preaching on the same subject tonight, and I suspect that our sermons will be totally different. So he didn't check with me about what, what, I, what he should speak about, so I guess we'll just, I'll just have to do it on my own. But at any rate, uh, uh, we'll be speaking as the Spirit leads us, I can guarantee you. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, and we will read uh, verse 16 uh, through the end of the chapter. If you could stand for the reading of God's word in honor of that. And it is Paul writing to the saints in, around, in and around Galatia, and he says, I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelry, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that who's, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, I'm sorry, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law, and those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Heavenly Father, add your blessing now to the reading of your word, and add your blessing to the preaching that is to take place. And we ask it in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. Well, this morning was an interesting morning. I didn't have Yvonne around to have to wake up and, and cajole to try to get her out of bed and all the rest of that stuff. And uh, normally what I do is I go up, I get out, I get up about 5 o'clock in the morning, and I go in and uh, turn, uh, the first thing I do, ever since I fell and had the big problem with my tongue and everything else, uh, Yvonne gets me this uh, powdered drink that, it, it, um, when you mix it up with milk, it tastes somewhat like uh, ground-up elephant's feet, and uh, it's really bad news. And so I mix it with a little bit of chocolate milk, and that's the only way I can get it down. And that's the first thing I do in the morning, which makes you understand I don't get up in the morning with a lot of optimism. But anyway, um, so I went in and took care of all of that, and then I sat down to listen. On Sunday mornings, I listened to about five or six preachers. Um, every Sunday morning. Some of them I don't listen to the whole sermon, I just get on the last part and the first part because I'm moving to some other, to some other uh, preacher. But one of them just really got to me today. <laughs> and I've, I've, I made a, a commitment to Yvonne about, oh, four or five years ago, I was gonna stop yelling at the television. Because she says, you know, that doesn't do you any good and it doesn't do them any good either. Uh, so I've, I have not done it, but she wasn't there this morning. <laughs> And the man just absolutely was hitting every button on me that was <laughs> that was wrong, and I and he, my goodness, he started off by saying, you know, there are some preachers that will tell you that people are totally depraved, but that's just wrong. And so I'm yelling to television immediately of uh, some uh, some uh, scriptural passages from Jeremiah, the heart is deceitfully wicked, who can know it? Uh, and in sin was I born, and, and from uh, from David. Uh, in sin did my mother conceive me, and in sin was I brought forth. But but we, we don't have total. There's no total depravity, and no and there's no such thing as original sin. And he kept going on, and I'm the boy. I am really boiling now. I'm really you know. And he kept going on, and he said, people, uh, people uh, are not brought to Christ by uh, supernatural means. What happens is they just hear the gospel and they decide that this is what they want in their life, the gospel. And so they're saved by the God. Well, the, the First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 through 4 does say that we're saved by believing the gospel, which is the death of Christ for our sins, uh, his burial and his resurrection. 
But I gotta tell you something, folks. We just didn't happen around and just listen to it one day and decide that's what I want. The Holy Spirit had something to do with it. But you see, in his, in his theology, and I know where he graduated from school from, and I know what church he's the pastor of, and in his theology, uh, for the all intents and purposes, the Holy Spirit died with the apostles. Well, I gotta tell you, he didn't die. Because God doesn't die. Even Jesus didn't die. He gave up the ghost voluntarily. So uh, the reason I say all that is I, I think in the, in the church today, there is, and I'm speaking in, in, in Christianity today, there is a, a vast bit of, of not, it's not, well, it's ignorance. Yeah, it's not stupidity. It's ignorance. We don't know any better because it's never been preached. There's the work of the Holy Spirit. There's, a, there's a, the, the uh, fruit of the Holy Spirit. And there's the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And they're not the same. The work of the Holy Spirit is found in John chapter 16, verse 16 and, and following, in which, the Holy, in which the Lord Jesus said, He, the Comforter, will come, and He will do three things in particular. Number one, He's going to convict men. And he's, going to, and he's going to convict them of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. That's his work. I just didn't, listen, I just didn't happen to turn on a TV set back in 1970, and I just didn't happen to listen to a preacher, and I just didn't happen to say, boy, that'd be the best thing for me. I had to be convicted that where I was headed was wrong and was going to get me in a bad Situation And the Holy Spirit had to do that. And had the Holy Spirit not led me to that position, I would have never gotten there uh, on my own, I can guarantee you. So the work of the Holy Spirit is absolutely definite in salvation. Because we have to be convicted of the fact that we can't make it our own, on our own. And we have to be convinced of the fact that God has the only way. And we have to be convinced also of the, and encouraged in the fact of walking in that way to get to our home in heaven. Then there's the then there's the work. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Then there's the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which you find in in, in the book of Ephesians chapter four, and you also find it in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter twelve. The gifts of the Spirit. When you got saved, how many of you got a gift? All of you did, because He gave gifts, gifts, gift singular and gifts sometimes plural. To, all, to every believer. And you find a list of those gifts. What's interesting to me, the same man who just really got to my push, push my buttons this morning, this same man believes that most of the gifts, this just really grabs me, were, died with the apostles. Which I can't find anywhere in Scripture. I, I don't find anywhere in Scripture that these gifts died when the apostles died. I know what they tell me. Uh, they, cause I, hey, I grew up in that kind of church. They, um, they tell me, uh, well, now you have to understand, that's inferred. <laughs> yeah. How many of you know when you get to inferring things, you can really go to seed on that real fast? Well, it's inferred in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. When I was a child, I spake like a child, but now that I'm mature, uh, you know, I don't need all that other stuff. I want to tell you something, folks. The gifts of the Spirit are still alive in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. They aren't alive in a lot of churches. I agree with that. But they're alive in the church of the Lord Jesus. And the ever last one of them is. I don't read that any of them. Now, listen, I don't want them practiced. I don't want them practiced in chaos. I don't want them practiced in, in, in craziness. I want them practiced according to what the Scripture says. Amen? But somebody says, do you, believe in, do you believe in the gift of healing? Of course. Do I believe in faith healers? No, but I believe in faith healing. It's a gift. It's a spiritual gift. So I'm going to believe in it. It's, 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 I don't read any place where they died. Of course, this man just managed to gloss over that and go on to his next point. But that's the gifts of the Spirit. Now we get over here to the fruits of the Spirit, and that's in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, and that's what we read here. 
The reason I start where I did in talking about the, the work of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit, and now the fruit of the Spirit, is because most people read this scripture, interestingly enough, wrong. <laughs> or they read it, I don't think they read it wrong, I think they just interpret it wrong. I, they put a word in there, or they live a word out, and they think that's what it says. I want you to read it. Verse 22, look at what it says. But the fruit of the Spirit. Notice, what, notice that the word Spirit is what? Capitalized. You know what that means? Because we've been talking about him all, and by the way, the Holy Spirit is a he. Is a he is, is, it's not an it. He's not an it. Uh, they, they've been talking about the Holy Spirit all the way through here. Now, how, more, how people read this in America today is the fruit of, this, the fruit of my spirit is. Well, I want to tell you, you want to know what your fruit of your spirit is? It's found just in verse 19. <laughs> That's the fruit of our spirit. That's where we are. The reason I say that is... When I first uh, became pastor out here, um, I didn't do a funeral for about six months, and I thought that was, a, that was a gift of God, and I was sure of it. And I didn't do a wedding for about a year, and I, I knew that was a gift of God. And um, finally, a couple came to me, and they said, uh, we'd like for you to marry us. And I had thought about what my answer was going to be. I, there, are some, there are some preachers that will not marry a divorced person to another person. Uh, I, know a person like, I know a preacher like that, and that's just a commitment that he made when he was ordained. Other preachers, they don't have a problem with marrying anybody. I decided in my heart that I could never marry a believer to a non-believer. I just couldn't do it. Now, every time I say that, Earl tells me about his situation. And um, Eileen told me about her situation. Was Uncle H.P. not a Christian? Yeah. Those two people told me about their situation in which Earl was one to the Lord because after they were married, because of Shirley, and, uh, and H.P. was one because of Aunt Eileen. Okay? You know, like, and I want to tell you something. And, and you were... Okay, there's three in here. Uh, that, the exception proves the rule. <laughs> what I will say, what I always told Earl was, and what I would tell uh, Eileen as well, there is a promise in Scripture in 1 Peter that says, if the woman and the man are married and the woman is a believer and the man isn't, the woman can win the man to Christ. But... She has to be strong in her faith. She has to be diligent. She has to pursue the Lord Jesus instead of the, the, the uh, man. And if she will do that, she will win him to Christ. In Earl's case, she did. In Kent's case, she did. And in H.P.'s case, he did. In Eileen's case, she did. I got news for you. Most people, most women aren't that strong. And I'm not criticizing women here. Most men aren't, wouldn't be that strong either, except we don't have that promise. <laughs> <laughs> there's no promise for a man there is for a woman but so I just made that commitment to myself because I have seen play, I have seen a lot of times where the woman thought she would win him to Christ and guess what she didn't because she stopped coming to church she stopped tithing she stopped praying she stopped reading her bible she stopped all that stuff because she wanted peace in the home, in the home. You know, you know them as well as I know them. So they came to me, and I committed myself to saying this to them. I will marry a couple, and I made this commitment, and I've never broken it. I will marry a couple of Christians, and I will marry two non-Christians. But I will not marry a Christian to a non-Christian because of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, which says, What fellowship hath light with darkness? What fellowship hath the sons of the sons of, Belial, the sons of God? I believe in separation. We preached on that one Sunday night here. I still believe in separation. I think it's a, it's a, biblical, a biblical doctrine. And the fact of the matter is, what people in America believe is that everybody has, has 
love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control within them. That's what they believe. That's the reason why they marry a believer to a non-believer. The reason I didn't was because a believer has this, a non-believer doesn't even know what those words are. As far as God's concerned, he has no idea what they are. The world has a completely different definition of these things than the church is supposed to have, and certainly than the Lord has. A completely different definition. So what we hear, and what this gentleman tried to tell me this morning was, that if we just live good lives, and if we say yes, and we confess Jesus Christ, and we're baptized in water, oh my stars, we have to be baptized in water. And I said, and he, and he quoted Acts 2.38. Well, let's just turn to Acts 2.38. Will we just can turn to it? Because I want you to read it. And I want you... Because we, we got to get this straight, folks. That's just... we got to get it straight. Acts 2.38. Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. You got it? Have you, have you got it in front of you? I'm going to ask you a question. Where's the water? How many have found the water in there? Not so. It's not there. Read over, in, read over in Romans chapter 6, the whole chapter of Romans chapter 6, and tell me where you find water. Well, you say the word baptize. The word baptize does not mean immersion in water. The word baptize is a transliteration of the Greek word baptizo, and it means to identify. What he's talking about here is the identification. Now, hear me on this. It's the identification of believers with Jesus Christ, and the only thing, the only entity that can identify you and baptize you into Christ is the Holy Spirit. That's it. This up here is a wonderful thing, and every believer ought to do that after they've been saved. Amen? Every believer ought to do it after they've been saved. But that's not what they're talking about here. Because if it were, it would say... And every one of you should be baptized in water in the name of the Jesus Christ. And that guy put it in there, and I thought, well, I bet I'd love to be right there and yell, Wait, hold the phone, Charlie. Where's the water? And I'd, you know what he'd say to me? Well, it's inferred. Yeah. A lot of things inferred. It's not there. Folks, if you're depending upon that to save you, you're in large trouble big time because it's not going to do it. We have to be baptized by what? The Holy Spirit. That's what identifies us with Jesus Christ. That's what immerses us in Him. That's what identifies us in Him. If we're going to have the fruits of the Spirit, we've got to be it, with the Spirit inside of us. The only way He gets there is for us to be identified with Him through His baptizing us into the family of God. That's it. I'm known, I'm known around town for being a Cincinnati Reds fan. I'm not proud of that this year, but uh, nonetheless, I'm known about being a I'm, I'm I'm identified as a Cincinnati Reds fan. I'm also identified as a Republican. Never got baptized either one of them. <laughs> I'm also known to, to an awful lot of people, and I hope most of the people, as a Bible-believing fundamental Christian who believes in the Word of God. I believe that's the one I'm interested in, and that's the one that I was immersed in the Holy Spirit to get. And he comes in, how much of me did he get? Now, let me rephrase that. How much, of he did, how much of me did he take? All of me. He didn't just get in my brain and say, well, now, feet, you can do what you want. He didn't just get in my heart and say, brain, you can think what you want. 
He's in there. How do I know he's in there? Romans chapter 5. Read the whole chapter. You get to the end of the chapter and he says, we know because his spirit his Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are His. I don't have to tell, I don't have to tell some, I don't have to have somebody tell me uh, that, uh, that God's Holy Spirit is in you. He bears witness with my spirit. How many wish you hadn't come tonight? Okay, so can I go on a little deeper? All right. The fruit of the Spirit. What I'm trying to say to you is, if you are living outside of Christ, if you have never been baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ, you don't have these things, these nine fruits. They are fruits of the Holy Spirit, not yours. That's the reason why if you marry the non-Christian to the Christian, the Christian's got the, Holy, the fruits of the Holy Spirit, the non-Christian doesn't, what's going to happen? How many of you know it's going to be problems? Because she's listening to God, he's listening to himself, and they aren't telling them the same thing. And as Bill Gothard used to say to everybody who came to him for marriage counseling, if the two partners aren't headed to the same goal, they're going to be divided before long. And that's the truth. So the fruit of the Spirit, having said all that, that is all <laughs> overview. <laughs> now we're in to the real sermon. And I got to get done by 8 o'clock so we can get home and have donuts. But anyway, um, the <laughs> here's the fruit of the Spirit. I want you to notice, folks, this is what God expects we shall produce. Love. Not lust. Love. What kind of love? The self-sacrificing love that Jesus showed upon the cross. The love that says, I'll promote you before I promote myself. The love that says, I'll take care of you before I take care of myself. The love that is self-sacrificing. That's the world looks at all that and says that, that that word love just means what can I get out of this situation joy well now does that mean you go ha 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 all the time no 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 if you do that they'll come with these little men with white uh, uh, outfits will come with butterfly nets and take you away no 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 that's not what that means. It means that we have an eternal joy that springs up to us that even in the worst and the horrible, horrible of cir circumstances, we understand one thing. This world is not forever. Hallelujah. And we got a home in heaven that outshines the sun. And we're going there. And some of us are going to be there before others. I used to say that with some confidence. I don't anymore. <laughs> I may be there before anybody else. Uh, I'm getting older and older as I find out, and as the uh, joints um, don't work as they should, and as I'm not as strong as I used to be. But joy. And then look at peace. Peace. What does the world see as peace? The world sees as peace a lack of conflict. <laughs> Well, you know what Jesus sees as peace? No chaos. I, it's interesting. I, I find so many people, I found them when I was teaching school, they, liked, they loved to live in melodrama. Oh, my stars. Every day is a new, a new chapter in a slop opera of their life. And, and they just live in it, and they just they wallow in it, and they just enjoy it, uh, I think, but they're, they're a mess to everybody around them. Listen, folks, peace is where we just know Jesus, and we know Jesus is going to take us. How do we know Jesus? The Holy Spirit in our heart tells us. He's baptized us into that. And, and long-suffering. What's the world's definition of long-suffering? I want it, and I want it now. 
right? We don't want to wait for anything. That's the reason we got. That's the reason we got microwaves. We don't use. Hey, listen, folks. People don't use microwaves to cook. They use microwaves to warm stuff up. They don't want to wait on the oven. They had shows. They used to have shows on TV. This is how you could cook on a microwave. They had to take them off because nobody was doing it. How many of you warm your cup of coffee up on a microwave? Or how many of you warm? Yeah, warm your uh, uh, Yvonne throws the uh, uh, noon meal together and she puts it in the microwave. I'm fine with that, you know. Uh, the, the point that I'm making is simply we don't like to wait. It's like the old Jewish proverb, I want, uh, I want patience and I want it now. You know, but what does Jesus say? What does, what does Paul write to us under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? We suffer long. <laughs> How long is long? I don't know. I've waited for one situation in my life to change now for about 17 years, and it hasn't. I waited for one situation to change for about 12 years. It finally did, and it wasn't, I didn't like the change, but that's the way, it, you know, I didn't have anything to do with it. I put it in God's hands, and he took care of it. How long is long? Kindness. Just being nice to people. Isn't that hard anymore? Because some people are hard to be nice to. I was uh, eating uh, with my brother and Yvonne uh, at uh, in Joplin or restaurant, and the lady came up to take our order, and I said, I want such and such. And she says, um, I hate to tell you this, on t it was a nice, fattening, greasy thing that I was ordering. And she said, uh, I said, I want pepper jack cheese on top of it. How many of you know that always adds to everything? Pepper jack cheese. Can I see your hands? Uh, yes. And uh, so I said, I want pepper jack cheese. She says, we're out of it. We ran out last night and we haven't got it yet. And I said, oh, well, okay, just put some regular cheese on it. And she said, you know, I had a person just absolutely tell me off the other day because I didn't have a particular thing back in the kitchen. And she said, I wanted to look at them and say, I don't have anything to do with it. They don't have it. Yell at them. Well, why yell at anybody? Hey, folks, it's just food. And the next time I'll get my pepper jack cheese, all right? I'll live without it. I lived a long time without it because we couldn't afford anything like that. Okay, but just, just the kindness and goodness, goodness. Just going out of your way to do something for somebody they didn't ask. Myla, every once in a while, still does it. Bless her sweetheart. I'll, the, the phone, the, the, um, the, it'll, the, the doorbell will ring and I'll go and she'll have a, a dozen chocolate chip cookies for me. And they almost make it to the kitchen. <laughs> Boy. And, and Laura will show up every once in a while and say, a dozen eggs or uh, this, that, or the other. I say, I'm so happy about that. And just to do something nice for somebody. Uh, Ross, uh, uh, on Wednesday night, generally gets me a, a glass of water if I'm needing it, and I did tonight. <laughs> I did tonight. It's, it's, it's an act of kindness. Why, why think it? You know, that's what we ought to be within the church, especially within the church toward each other. Faithfulness. Oh, well. How many of you are sitting there thinking, well, that's me. I mean, I've listed everything else, and you yep, yeah, that's, that's what I do. Yep, yep, yep. Faithfulness means faithfulness in being in God's house. Faithfulness means my testimony on Sunday night, Wednesday night, Sunday morning is just as strong as, and my testimony all the rest of the world, week is just as strong as it is on Sunday night, Sunday night, Sunday morning, and Wednesday night. Faithful in God's house. Faithfulness. Listen, most people can't be faithful. The, 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 the statistics on unfaithfulness in marriage are just really staggering to the point that in America today, they don't expect it. In fact, in America today, they don't even get bothered to get married most of the time. 
but the but the but but one the ones that do even among the ones that do the faithfulness among married people is the unfaithfulness among married people is staggering if you don't believe that watch uh, family feud every once in a while and listen to some of their questions and listen and see what the answers were faithfulness the big you know what it said the scripture says it is required in stewards that a man be faithful And we are all, the minute we were saved, we all became stewards of the manifold grace of God. It's unfortunate we don't preach it. And now you can see church after church after church that because the crowd gets smaller and smaller on Wednesday night, they do what? Cancel them. Because, because there's so many other activities on Wednesday night during the school year, we, or during, during the summer, that we just, uh, we just do away with the services. Uh, listen, folks, if you do away the services on that rationale, during the summertime, you'll never open them back up because there's always plenty of things to do. Our church, we should be here in this auditorium tonight praying for the Sunday night and the Wednesday night services. Well, thank you, Earl. I appreciate that. We should be praying for them. We should be praying for the Sunday morning service, of course, but praying for the Sunday night and the Wednesday night service, too, that the church get on fire enough to be here. Because I'm going to tell you, a great church is made up of great people with great testimonies of faithfulness faithfulness and then self-control oh, the last one self-control what's the opposite what's the world think about self-control we don't like it we like impulsiveness and the opposite of self-control is impulsiveness I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it as I feel led to do it it's all about me and what I want to do it's the me generation The fruit of the Spirit. Now, this title of the sermon was The Secret of the Fruit Basket. So I'm going to give it to you. Ready? How many think, boy, this is great. Fantastic. Look, I'm going to get all this. The secret. It's no secret. It's in Scripture. These fruits will be in us as a result of the Holy Spirit ruling our lives ruling our lives the secret is simply a secret that jesus said in john chapter 15 the chapter preceding the chapter that we read about the works of the spirit and the secret is this if you abide in me and i abide in you the closer we are to the tree trunk the closer we are to the mother vine the greater our fruit will be. We don't have, to, and you know what? It'll be produced just simply because we're in the vine. We're abiding in the vine. We're not out trying to do our own thing. We're abiding in the vine. We're close to the vine. We're reading about the vine. We're listening about the, who's the vine? The Lord Jesus. We're listening to the vine. We're reading about the vine. We're praying. We're asking God to simply fill our lives. Let our lives be full of the fruit of the Spirit. And we are as close, listen, as close as we can get to Him, the more our tree will be burdened down with these wonderful fruits of the Spirit. Now, every believer is going to have them. Because the fruit says the fruit of the Spirit. You have to, if you have the Spirit of God and you're going to have these fruit, some of you are going to, some of us, some, I've seen it and you have too, some people are going to wind up and their fruit is going to be so shriveled and dry you can't tell an orange from a lemon. And others are going to have fruit that they're just, I mean, they're just that big around and they burden down the tree and all the rest of it and it's just the most amazing, wonderful thing to watch. And as you get older and older, you get a chance to see it. As you watch people's lives, you get a chance to see it. I know if I told this story and she were here, she'd probably hit me over the head with a cane. 
But um, years ago, back here in the little auditorium on, on a Labor Day Sunday morning, I, I was preaching. We had 166 that morning. It was the biggest crowd we'd had that summer in my first summer here. And walking through the door was Dick and Holden and Susan. And they're great friends of mine. Dick was a great friend. Now, Dick was the type of person who'd carry on a conversation with a gate post. So, I mean, everybody loved Dick. And, and Susan was a sweet lady, too. But um, Hulda was one of the quietest people you ever saw in your life. I think it was because Dick was so loud. And by the way, Dick had, this was a, this was a normal uh, voice for Dick. Hi, Earl, how you doing? I mean, Dick couldn't, he couldn't whisper if his life depended upon it. And um, so in the course of time, Susan united with the church. Dick and Holden never did. But uh, that was all right. They're Christians, so I didn't care. Well, I did care, but <laughs> I understood. In the course of time, in about three years, Susan um, fell um, ill and died uh, to cancer. And I did her funeral. And about two years later, uh, Dick died of uh, heart failure and of uh, congestive heart failure and of kidney failure. And I did his funeral. Um, and I asked Calda, I said, is it all right if I just come over once in a while and just check on you? Because I wasn't her pastor. And she said, I'd be happy for you too. And for every, <laughs> almost every Thursday afternoon, since that day, I've been over there for an hour, an hour and 15, 30 minutes, talking to Hulda. I wish I were at liberty to tell you what she does for other people. I'm not. She won't allow it. But every once in a while, I'll walk in, and the first thing, and she's not rich. They're not, they're not wealthy people. They live in a little, she lives in a little house over there on, I think, Sycamore Street. And... Uh, my goodness, the car they drove was 18 years old. Um, they got, she's got Social Security, and she's got Dick's Social Security and, and retirement, and that's about it. But I walk in, and she'll say, anybody need anything out of church? And if I know somebody that needs something, and, and, uh, and sometimes she'll, she'll volunteer, and she said, I hear so-and-so, not even a member of, this church or of her or her home church or whatever she says i know they're having a tough time of it and she always says this to me she says i'll write you the check you give it to janie you tell janie who to give it to but don't you tell anybody i don't know how many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and even thousands of dollars she's given away i look at her life and she's, I, I sit there for an hour, an hour and 15 minutes every Thursday afternoon, I'm amazed. I never hear a crossword out of her. We talk about, we talk about her past, she's 94 years old, and we talk about how things were when she came to this county, and she knows everybody. And I'll say, well, I taught the kids, and I don't know about the kids. <laughs> <laughs> and she'll look at me and she says, well, you know, she said the parents, they had a tough time of it. And she'll go ahead and tell me the tough time they had. That she is the walk, to me, she is the walking, talking example of a tree that's just getting, I want you to understand this word, fruitier and fruitier. Just exactly what Christians are supposed to be. Just exactly what Christians are supposed to be. Listen, folks, we don't get this by our own spirit. We get this through the Spirit of God. And you can't have the Spirit of God unless you've been baptized by His Spirit into His family divine. And that comes at the moment of salvation. I trust that everybody in here is saved. If you aren't saved, this is the night to do something about it. You may be a member of this church, and you may not be a member of this church. You may have been baptized, you can be baptized, pasteurized, homogenized, and simonized, and still, and still not get it. It's to be baptized by the Spirit of God. This is pointless to you until that has happened. And when that has happened, this is what you will start to live, by the Spirit of God. Do you know something, folks? God's sovereign. Did you see the passage of Scripture on the board this morning? 
when Andy preached. It's Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will bring it to pass in the day of the Lord. Does that say he will do it? Yes. You know why it can say that? Because God is sovereign. Amen? God is sovereign. So tonight, if you need, to, if you need Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you know you do. <clears throat> you come. If tonight you want to simply rededicate your life to the Lord Jesus, and if tonight maybe you can make a decision in the, in the pew that you, what you want to do is you just pray to God, please, dear Lord, let my tree show every bit of all of these wonderful fruits of the Spirit. As we pray, Heavenly Father, now we give this invitation to you. It is your invitation. It is by your Spirit and by your power say, that you have said uh, to us. And so we, uh, we just ask you to bless it. And as we sing this song, we pray, dear Father, that those who need to make a commitment to you tonight, need to make it may, maybe rededication, maybe salvation, whatever, Lord, that they'll be strong enough to do it this evening. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Our hymn of invitation is number 488, Just As I Am With